get a little more right, of this. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. Oh, great. Thank you. 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 Hello, hello. Hello. Okay. It is it is four o'clock. We'll call the um, uh, May fifth, uh, two thousand fourteen meeting to order with a uh, roll call, please. Mayor Householder here. Commissioner Blanchard here. Commissioner Crawford here. Commissioner Hardy here. Commissioner Shirley here. At this time, those are who are available uh, to do so. Um, if you would stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance at a moment of silence. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We now move on to awards and proclamations. The week of May 3rd through May 11th, 2014, as Travel and Tourism Week in the city of Salina, Hank Boyer, Chair, Convention and Tourism Committee, and Sylvia Rice, Visit Salina Director, will read the proclamation. Hello. Hi, Commissioners. Mayor. 2014 Kansas Tourism Week. Whereas travel matters deeply to the economic prosperity of Salina of Kansas of the nation, as well as to business wealth and to comfort and pleasure of individual travelers, and whereas tourism is responsible for creating 4.4% of the total Kansas gross state product and is the, large, is the third largest industry in the state based on economic development, and whereas travel to and within Kansas provides significant economic benefits for the state, generating $5.8 billion in economic output in 2011, with $4.5 billion in direct benefit to core tourism industries while spurring an additional $1.3 billion in economic enhancement to indirect industries. And whereas travel is among Kansas' largest private sector employers, supporting 128,000 plus core industry jobs in 2011, an increase of 7.8% more than 2009, an additional 19,580 indirect jobs were supported by core tourism activity. And whereas traveler spending generated 14.4% of all Kansas state and local tax revenues, <coughs> resulting in a tourism tax contribution average of $917 per Kansas household. And whereas leisure and business travel taken in Kansas spurs countless benefits to travelers, creativity, cultural awareness, education, happiness, productivity, relationships, and wellness. And whereas 2011 tourism expenditures contributed $245 million to the economic wealth of Saline County, and whereas in 2011 tourism represented a 3.5% share of the total Sling County expenditures, and tourism expenditures in Sling County represented a 3.2% share of total state tourism expenditures, recording a growth of 8.8% over 2010. And whereas travel is a catalyst that moves local, state, and national economics forward, and now, therefore, I, Aaron Householder, Mayor of Salina, do hereby proclaim May 3 through 11, 2014, as Travel and Tourism Week in Salina, Kansas and urge the citizens of Salina to join me in this special observance with appropriate events and commemoration. Thank you. What uh, events do you have planned uh, this week? You guys taking a trip somewhere? <laughs> no, that's not a bad idea. Actually, we just took a trip somewhere. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we really kicked off Tourism Week in a big way. Uh, we did take a trip. We took a trip to Wamego, Kansas, and we participated in the Kansas Sampler Festival, where we worked with local partners that included Slime Arts and Humanities and Parks and Recreation and Kenwood Cove, the Bicentennial Center, Rolling Hills Zoo, um, the, the Salina Community Theater, the Stiefel Theater, uh, the River Festival, uh, and also with Lindsberg and McPherson and created the Heart of Kansas Tent. Um, Wamego was
was the smallest community to ever have hosted the, the Sampler Festival in 25 years. We welcomed over 12,000 people, almost 12,000 people through their gates, which is a record setter. So we spent two beautiful days, one a little warmer than the other, but two beautiful days talking about all there was to see and do in, in um, this part of the state. Slanted Downtown Inc. did a phenomenal job in representing all of the food industries in our communities, our, our specialty foods. On Saturday we did little samples of Cozy's and on Sunday we did little samples from Martinelli's and from El Atron. It was a great weekend. So that's how we kicked off Tourism Week. Uh, Today we're kicking off a local campaign. We talk a lot in our reporting about what tourism does in our economy. And one of the challenges we've always had is really tracking who our visitors are. And so we're officially kicking off our What Brings You to Visit Salina campaign. So that the desk clerks at the hotels who have already really started this can remember to ask that question. What brings you? If they're not wearing shin guards for a soccer tournament and they're not wearing square dance studs, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell. And so we're trying to expand that that sort of uh, memory tickler to them, to our attractions and so forth. We've got representatives from the tourism industry with us. We've got hoteliers here. We've got attractions folks here. We've got our partners from the Bicentennial Center and others to help us kick that off. Uh, we'll also start a secret visitor program this week where we'll have folks going out and kind of testing their knowledge about I've got an eight-year-old with me. What is there to see and do in your area? And to see if those front desk clerks, those wait staff folks can answer those questions and reward them on the spot. So that's what we're doing this week. Among the things we just do all the time. Great ideas. So. It's very important, obviously, from the tax dollars we can see and, yeah. and uh, the continuing the research. I know I was on, uh, I didn't make all the meetings or a little early in the morning, but you did have the best, <laughs> you have the best breakfast of any of the meetings. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> It, it's uh, Thanks, it's Andy. you guys yeah you guys do a great yeah, right yeah you guys do a great job and, and always researching and trying to make things better we really appreciate it. I've got your signed proclamation Thanks. up here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Tiffany's got a button for each of you so that you can all remember in your walks of life to ask folks when you see them on the street if you're not from here what brings you to visit Salina. Thank you. <clears throat> we now go into the Citizens Forum part of our meeting. This is an opportunity for anyone to come up and speak regarding an is any issues that are not on today's uh, agenda. Uh, be sure you give your name and address. And uh, we normally limit to five minutes. If there's not a lot of people, though, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. So anybody who has anything for us, please come forward. Hello, hello. Hello, Judy Larson, 715 North 9th. Um, I am on the committee that is dealing with a petition to expand the county commission of Saline County from three people to five. In order to do this, we need 1,700 signatures. And, and I made a little sign that says, sign the petition to expand the county commission. And uh, I'm put, putting this up at various places. Um, you have to be a registered voter to sign the petition. And if you're not a registered voter, you can go get registered. And then my phone number is 376-2285. You call me and I will come bring the petition to you. So uh, we need to get this done. And we're trying to get uh, a little more diversity in the commission and um, we're working really hard. Um, if any of you know Janice or David Norland, they also have petitions. Randy, what is what is uh, her last name? Her la Chelsea. What's Chelsea's last name? You know, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, Sorry. She's new to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's on the committee too, and I thought I was trying to think of her name. But anyway, uh, three seven six two two eight five. If you want to sign the petition, give me a call. I'll bring it to you. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anyone else with anything they'd like to bring before the commission on any item that is not on today's agenda? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. <coughs> item 6.1, approve the minutes of the April 24th, 2014. Uh, item 6.2, authorize staff to solicit bids for the Vortex Avenue water line, city project number 14-3033. 
6.3 award the contract for roof replacement of 11 shelter houses in Lakewood Park, project number 14-3035 to Midwest Siding Inc. in the amount of $23,100. 6.4 award the contract for the 2014 mill and inlay part two to APAC Kansas in the amount of $447,082.13 plus a 5% 5 construction contingency. Is there any item on the consent agenda the commissioner would like to remove or amend uh, from the consent agenda? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'd uh, like to remove 6.2. Any other items the commissioner would like to remove? Mr. Mayor, I would like to remove 6.3. 6.3. Any other items? Okay. Not, not a removal, but a change. Uh, I believe Monday was April 28th, not the 24th. Oh, on the minutes? Yes, on the minutes. I have my calendar in front of me, but if it is, <laughs> so I'll, I won't disagree. So, so noted. Maybe we'll, with that, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the uh, two remaining items on the consent agenda with that date change of <coughs> April 28th, I guess. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the 6 1 and uh, I believe 6 3 on the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That motion carries 5-0. Now we'll go back to, uh, I'm sorry, item 6-2, I believe, is the first one you wanted pulled. Is that correct? 6-2, correct. Yeah. Ms. Tasker. Uh, would you like me to make a short uh, presentation, or would you just like to ask questions? Just a short one, please, and I think probably one or two Things might be covered in that, and then I have some questions. Okay. Um, actually, have the Vortex Avenue water line project on the screen over there, which would be s the same document that's in your uh, packet, but might be easier to point out a few things. Um, basically, um, this project came about in line with uh, the Veris Technology facility that was proposed here a few months back. And as we were reviewing this project uh, through the design review team, we uh, came up with some issues from the standpoint of providing fire protection to the Veris Technologies facility. And um, so going back in history to give you a little understanding of how this was originally laid out, the original plat for the entire industrial area was done in the late 1980s. And at that time, um, this this portion here was basically two lots and the water line traveled uh, the existing water line was through this portion and the point at that time was the fire protection and water would be off of the existing water line since that time the lots have been laid out differently the water <coughs> lines been relocated to kind of get to the short of it this water line was related or relocated uh, for this facility I think in the 90s and then just uh, last year the water line that was ran through this area was relocated around to allow us to set up for this lot for Varus and then this in turn into a second lot try to make it uh, you can't see the lines on there very well but originally the um, property line was in this general area so this whole piece was one large lot now it's divided up as two lots as you can probably see closer on there so going back to providing uh, fire protection for Varus and working with the fire department it became obvious that we really didn't have a, a very good way to provide fire protection to Varus with the uh, two entrances that are right in this location and uh, Roger Williams and I worked together closely to determine how could we best provide fire protection. Typically the fire department likes to connect onto the uh, fire hydrant and then drive to the fire. So uh, they need two uh, fire hydrants to provide the protection. So they looked at one of these on Scanlon and then we needed an additional one at this point. Truly can't get to any of these other fire hydrants that are around the outside because there's just not access to them. So. Uh, and then once we started looking at all the different ways we could lay out the line, we chose this route because it provided uh, fire protection to this lot. Uh, this corner right here now is FedEx. You may remember that facility. And then there will be an empty lot right here. 
so we'll be able to provide fire protection to that and the entrance in most of these cases or all of them we hope will come off a of vortex so when they're fighting a fire fire hydrant on vortex would be convenient and that's really what drove us to this layout um, kind of in a nutshell and as we were looking at this we thought the uh, the funds that we put in the uh, under the resolution 11-10596 this really fit well for that because it was uh, water and wastewater infrastructure that was necessary to support economic development and uh, we can go more into the number of jobs and the dollars but um, you may have been involved with that that was a few months back but we can provide that information if you're interested so that's kind of the short order of how we got here okay a uh, couple of quick questions if you can go back to the to the site plan or the uh, the plat plan on the on the water lines there do we have a general <coughs> rule see where the hand is right there in the middle of the screen kind of by that connected to existing water right here Th yeah there's a that's a dead end connection there is that within is that like do we have a standard that we don't want to go beyond a certain length of a dead end or when you say dead end well that water line goes off of Scanlon there and it goes to the um, west this is an existing water line tied in down on Waterwell Road. Comes yeah, up. I, j j just a general question: Do we have do we have a standard length that because we generally want to loop? Right. W what we're doing is we're accomplishing a loop here, but the property immediately to the north of that has a has a water line that comes in and kind of ends right there at the building. Is that a different? The, this is a solid water line that continues on up Arnold. So this is a continuous line. Right, yeah, that one right there. Okay. That is basically a, a fire hydrant lead up to that building. That's correct. Okay. Do and in looking at the information with Roger, we needed uh, about 2,250 gallons per minute, two fire hydrants. And so we tried to look at um, if we had any issues with Water Well Road, what fire protection could we get to this area if this line was out of service and then this would truly be a long dead in line if it wasn't looped back and the difference was between 1200 gallons a minute with this out of service versus um, having okay, a loop yeah, cause in place. Just, so at first glance I just kind of look at if you were to tee that off of that line directly and west of these properties it's about the same distance in that that and it would get us to there but we looked at giving us some redundancy of this tie tying these loops together in the event the old water well water line um, which was out of which, service. Which, which strengthens the entire system. It does and it okay. really improved our fire flow protections to this area plus it gave us some redundancy in the event and also it gets us uh, water service for this lot here. Okay. And um, we assume they'll all access off have their entrance off a of vortex so a fire hydrant out to where they can pull into the facility is what <laughs> seems favorable to the fire department yeah. so and, and this may be a question that you're going to be able to an answer might not be able to answer um, in April 2011 when this when the ordinance was put down and we d established that there was uh, the economic development incentive mm -hmm. of providing the hundred thousand dollars or whatever the cost would be to uh, to put water on these projects. <clears throat> uh, that that's one thing set aside that apparently that was that was in place. Yet in November of last year, when we were looking at a tax rebate incentive for this thing, that wasn't made part of the that wasn't made part of the information. I feel like there was already incentives provided on this project that weren't it just seems to me that we need to include all of the incentives when we have the information coming forward about a tax rebate and uh, because I have to imagine that we're not obligated to do this that in some instances there is a special <coughs> assessment for on the individual property owners to provide this so um, I see how in 2011 it was determined that this was a reasonable incentive to provide and that's okay and I don't I don't have issue with that it's just I would have liked to have that complete information when we were making the decision on the 
on the tax rebate. So am I? What's, what's, I'm not sure I'm following the context of the location of the tax rebate question. Was that downtown question? No, no, no. That, okay. No, I, I'm not talking locations here. Right now I'm just talking about, well, the assumption is, is that if you look all around town, that there may be instances where we would say this might be a better well, opportunity to incentivize versus something else. You're just saying at the time that we addressed the tax uh, exemption for that property, of also at the same time addressing the water question. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that right? Yeah, okay. that that, okay. that I would have liked to have those together so that we would have had the big picture of what the total incentive was because it kind of seems that this one came in a little bit. Yeah, behind? I'd, I'd have to ask Martha, I don't know with regards to the timing question you mentioned if at the time that was done, was there an assumption that the rear access to the water was sufficient or when did the... It really became more <coughs> about as we were going through the design review team meeting and uh, started really looking in detail at the fire protection. Now should have we figured that out in advance? You know, we could always say looking back that would have been a good idea but we just didn't really come to that reality until they brought their building plans in and we sorted through all of it and got everybody in the room at the same time so it's, um, and so on <coughs> to, to follow up with that commissioner typically that's what you would see yes. you would see yeah. a situation in which if there was a uh, private company that's asking for whatever type incentive that we may offer that all of those are packaged up as a discussion item at that point in time so that one kind of evolved unfortunately but Normally, that's what you're asking is what you would expect to see. Okay, because that's what I just when we to talk do. about cost yeah. benefit ratios and Wichita State model and all this other stuff, I just don't know if that has any impact on would that have any impact on the overall? Do you put it all together and figure out what that is? or It would have some. Um, now, given that I believe there are, what, three lots that this serves on the south and west side, and then this also would provide some service to the north, wouldn't it? Yes, it's uh, set up to provide service to all three lots in here and this existing lot that's empty. So so the benefit attributable to uh, the Vares property it would be a fraction of that cost. It would probably be a little bit less than a fourth I would say because that north lot's a little larger than the others. So there is there's no question there's some benefit that would typically go into that type of ratio. Um, if it was the only property being served there'd be more of an impact to it if, but since there's uh, three other lots there it's probably going to be fairly minor but there is some. But, and that's a, are the other lots, uh, are they still the ownership of the airport authority or are they in private? I, I don't know. I'd have to ask that I question. I believe this lot, and Tim Rogers is here, is airport authority and the north is airport authority. FedEx is on the one at, on the corner. Tim right. says yes. So. Okay, great. Um, and, and then, and I'm sorry, John. I'm one. sorry. And then just my, my general stock question and my concern, and I, and I raised this at the November 18th meeting was just that I'm concerned that sometimes we provide incentives for other locations in town and we end up having companies move from one part of town and abandon one location in favor of another location in which it's, you know, we're kind of cannibalizing ourselves on, on some things like that. And I just, you know, I mentioned it before and, and I'm not quite sure what the answer, uh, I didn't have time to look back at the, the uh, video from the meeting, but uh, my my concern again is that uh, we're going to have the rest of Geo Probe move out of North Salina and and establish down here and and uh, leave a leave a gap up there. So um, I don't know if anybody can address what they know about that or if they know anything about that and and uh, what maybe some what their future plan is for. Uh, Geo probe and Veris being in two different places. Well, I can definitely say I can't address that. I mm -hmm. think that anyone, <coughs> I'll be speculation. So I'm, I don't okay. believe anyone here today could answer that for you, John. Okay, and and, and just just so you know, I, I I'm completely supportive of the decision made back in 2011 of what they did. I just have those concerns. And. Uh, in conjunction with the fire protection, I think it does provide some overall benefit to the city to where we have that loop in the event, the other line. So I think it serves more than just the purpose of providing 
for these three lots, it does some allows us to improve our fire protection in the area. Right, and I know that you do that all over town. You're trying to do that too. We're, so we we try to get the the most we can out of fire protection, and particularly in these type of areas, the the better the fire flow. We never know what type of facility is going to come in in the future and what they're going to need. So, right, um, we try to do as the best we can at the time we make improvements. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Uh, no. Is, uh, you might, you may, may or may not know this. I was just curious about: is, is there a line that defines um, where economic development and assessment meet, or is that a moving target all the time? For for something like this, for something like this water line, I, I can make a case for it being an assessment. I, I guess you can make a case for it being economic development. Yeah, and initially it was assessment when the project was first. Uh, put into place in the late 80s and over time um, just the lots have been reshaped and reformed to meet the needs and uh, looked at this um, as a very small area and more of an economic development as opposed to the assessment portion and um, obviously the airport authority had done a lot as far as locating lines for water and sewer in the future and had paid assessments for the area. Do you anticipate any other situations like this on existing airport property not on this property at this point because it's pretty well laid out I think yeah C Commissioner Tim? I can I can add to that too it, if in Martha if you can pull up that or have Melissa pull up that resolution that might get okay. into that historically we we've, we've always tried to assess just about any property uh, either do assessment or what we call a cost recovery it's a mm -hmm. slightly different approach um, to development but in, in reviewing in the last few years our approach we found that quite honestly um, you know, sometimes there's a but for from a financial perspective, and sometimes there's a but for I'm going to stay where I'm at and I'm not coming to Salina or whatever whatever that issue might be. And so the thinking has evolved more into uh, the ability to provide get that lot to if you want to call it shovel ready or development ready or whatever that is. This is really a small piece, I mean a small application or a small example of that approach. But uh, it's basically said we have the ability to deal with the key utility questions. Uh, and so when this, and, and if you could, Liz, if you could uh, increase that size a little bit there. Um, it's, it's really clear that when this was put together, right wrong, or, right, right, wrong, or otherwise, it was intended to say this is part of the package we can, we can do and make sure that it's ready for the development without question. You know, certainly there's nothing that would prevent the city uh, in any way from recovering that cost as we would possibly under an old policy. Uh, that's a policy choice. This really wasn't intended to do that. It was intended to more hit that development ready and not put the burden on uh, with the thought that, one, if, if we do decide to recover, <clears throat> we're going to have to get into a whole lot of criteria. Um, now, one thing to add, speaking of that, is that I, we did check and we have, with the uh, jobs here, we have their non existing and, and 16 jobs that are to be created within five years that would meet the quality job. And we've, we've kind of said, even though, well, we have formalized in our strategic plan, but we've said we want to only incentivize. Uh, uh, projects with jobs that would meet quality or premier levels. This does do that, so keep that in mind. Um, but really the intent is to try to be out in front of it and have a site ready so it's, it's good to go with development. And so it's a little different approach um, rather than to put the cost burden on there. Doesn't mean that we have to do that and, and there's no, I mean, from a policy perspective, there's no restriction placed, self-imposed on the governing body or anything like that. But that was that was the, the approach, is to get out ahead, get lots ready. Uh, this one kind of fell a little bit behind in timeline, but only because it, the issue really kind of evolved from where they started in the first place. Otherwise, we would have tried to be more out ahead of it. Right now, we're in the process of looking and prioritizing various sites to the community that we believe are, are oriented towards uh, manufacturing and industrial development and so forth, and then think of, and, and then really inventory and say, what are the criteria to be development ready, which includes water, wastewater, includes storm water, includes street access, <coughs> excuse me, and a few other things, and then try to figure out and end up bringing that back to you to say, where does it make sense today to invest in those properties, or are we in a position to do what we might call a just-in-time approach if we have a prospect? So we're, it's sort of an evolution of that, and, but this was really the first formal step in that evolution that we've taken. So if a... Um client came in and, and they decided they'd like to be situated beside Barris, say. Um, the cost to them to procure that land, to buy the land, say, uh, would be just the cost of the land, not of the cost of the water line. Is that correct? 
I would say unless we um, put together what would be a, a cost recovery mechanism there that could be our, our other approach that we have, uh, the answer is yes. Now we could do that if we, for example, if we uh, said we, if you have quality of premier level jobs, no problem. If you don't, we'd like you to pay, then we'd want to put some form of a cost recovery uh, for that particular uh, purpose. That does get a little bit difficult when we think about what number, is it a majority, is it not, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, certainly we could do that. Now I will say uh, if we go back, and I think uh, Mr. Rogers could answer this better, but given the nature of most of the jobs that have been uh, recruited and or, and or expanded in that area, I, I would say that it's probably pretty safe to say by far a majority or a, a large majority wouldn't meet the quality standard uh, just by virtue of the history we've seen out there. So I don't think there's a big risk of that. Was that a would or would not? Would, would, meet, would, would meet, meet the quality uh, standard, at least the quality standard. Any other questions for staff? You know what, just one real quick one and maybe, the, maybe someone else can answer, answer this as well. In the November 18th meeting it was, uh, a date was thrown out as August, August 2014 that, that construction and so on would likely be completed and mm -hmm. so on. Is that, does this affect that at all? Because uh, they set that date before they knew what the water requirements were going to be. Our intent is to have this constructed and ready for use by August 1st. Okay. So we've been talking with the general contractor and about driveways and the work they have done and coordinating so that we'll meet their needs. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Tasker. Any comments from the public on this issue? Now that I bring it back to the Commission for a possible action. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move that we authorize staff to solicit bids for the Vortex Avenue Waterline Project Number 14-3033. Second. I have a motion and a second to authorize uh, funds for the Vortex Avenue Waterline City Project Number 14-3033. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That motion carries. Five zero, ma'am. I saw you had your hand up. Was there another? It was there something in the consent agenda you wanted to talk about? We, we don't normally do it, but but, but today, I, go ahead. I, you obviously, I haven't seen you at the meeting before, so you've obviously taken time out of your day to come in. So please. Yeah, this is my first time here, so I was kind of hesitant about sure. about coming up, and then I raised my hand. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, my name is Norma Linneruger, eleven eleven Tally Drive here in Salina. I'm a five-time author and a uh, published poet, and uh, that uh, my poem is uh, upstairs where they're recognizing the city and county employees, and I went up there and looked at it, and uh, so I am going to appreciate when they put it on television live, like tomorrow morning, I think, or Saturday night at 8 o'clock or something. I'll be kind of looking forward to that. Uh, I will read it. It won't take me too long, Mayor. Sure. The employee. E is for the effort you have displayed. M is for the manner you have conveyed. P is for the punctuality to which you did adhere. L is for the leadership yourself and your fellow peers. O is for the orders to which you did comply. Y <coughs> is for the yesterdays that have passed on by. E is for the endeavor to achieve one's goal. E is for the endurance you did uphold. Norma Linneberger, author, poet. And when will these, these will be on that uh, Community Access TV you said? Uh, yeah, I believe tomorrow morning at 7 and then Saturday night at 8 p.m. Okay. So, so tomorrow morning, you say tomorrow morning at 7, tomorrow evening at 8. And it's a variety of local poets or? Uh, as far as I know, looking around, it's just myself. Maybe, maybe yourself. Then. <laughs> okay. Right, right. And then I'll buy a DVD, a tape, uh, I think, uh, two weeks from today. Well, great. A young man told me back here. Uh, great. Well, thank you for coming up. Like well, I said, I, I, I saw you raise your hand there, and I know sometimes if you're new to the meetings, the, the yes. format kind of passes you by. And so, uh -huh. uh, well, thank you for having me come up uh, a little bit later. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank, sir. thank you so much. Um, and back to the next item was, uh, I believe, was six four. Is that was the other item pulled out? Was that six correct? Three. Six three. I'm sorry, six three. Dion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would open it up to questions, or if you want me to go through the, uh, no. the document itself, whatever would be easiest. That's not necessary. The only questions I had were in regard to the the contract format. Okay. Uh, which uh, I found a little bit 
um, I guess, antiquated perhaps. And I was going to ask a question about that. Uh, I, I found some language that was not gender neutral, for instance, and, and also some phrases like war clause, which um, I, don't, I don't know if that's still appropriate or if that's changed or how it's changed. And so I, um, I was just going to inquire about that in terms of how we put our contracts together and, and does anyone review them every now and then to, to determine as to whether or not they're still um, appropriate. Sure. You want me to ask for that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> may, Mr. Banks, yeah. jump in and I'll... Jump on in. I'll take that opportunity if I may, and I, I do appreciate the opportunity because it, it is, I think, an opportunity to explain uh, where we are in that process. Um, and your point is well taken about there are some uh, antiquated male pronouns in certain of those sections that we need to get rid of. Uh, the process that is underway, and maybe you've noticed it as you've looked at your agenda items, uh, at the city manager's direction, we have been working on a process whereby uh, we as legal counsel are involved, uh, but a system that enables uh, the departments and staff to be principally involved in the development of the documents. I think if you look at the base document there on this particular item and any that you might have seen recently either involving contractors or consultants, uh, you'll see the base document uh, uses defined terms and I don't believe we, we will have erred if you will find any gender based, uh, well I think we've pretty well eliminated the use of pronouns uh, in those documents and defied, defined terms like contractor and consultant so that you consistently refer to who it is that you're speaking of and, and you don't have to use uh, male, female, any, you know, that's, that's kind of the current, I think, the current style is to try to get away from the use of pronouns as much as possible so that you don't get in those gender specific situations and where you can use plural nouns uh, and then use uh, there and uh, use uh, plural pronouns as well uh, to get away from that situation. Uh, admittedly on those general clauses, uh, work has been done on those general clauses uh, but they are a work in process and uh, the points that you make, the sections that uh, we've had a chance to look at since uh, you raised the point uh, are those that uh, I think we can we had not worked on them substantively yet and that's usually what has been driving the work on elimination of any of the gender specific pronouns uh, but this I think emphasizes the point that we need to get maybe not let the substantive work lead that charge and that we go ahead and just anywhere where we can and uh, in some of those uh, remaining sections uh, where we'll still need to do a little more work on the substance to go ahead and just get rid of the gender specific pronouns. So your, your point is well taken but that's where we are in the process as I say uh, to get to a point where frankly there is a minimization of legal time and expense uh, and a standardization but that's where we are in the process. Um, oh, I had another question on the tip of my tongue. It escapes me at the moment. Thank you for, for bringing yeah, no, that what up, a, Commissioner what a nice Hardy. Guy. That was great. What a, you did. It's important. Yeah. It, it is. is. Well, Very good. <laughs> um, uh, no, that's it. I think that's it. Well, think. since the door's open, let me ask a couple of questions. <laughs> okay. oh. Can I raise my hand? And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, two things. One, um, in reading through here, it's a there are they 24 gauge uh, standing seam their metal roofs Correct. is that standard throughout I mean how, how many shelters are there these are 11 how many are there total in the whole system in, in the well in Lakewood first all, that's all, all 11 of them. Mm -hmm. okay and then what about the system I couldn't answer off the top of my head in the system but to answer your question yes that is the new standard that we would utilize for all the okay, shelters so we're gonna go to a okay correct Good deal. And then the other thing is, is, is this is this is a concern of mine since this is going to be ongoing construction, and we're now into the period where people are going to be using the park uh, quite a bit more. And that is, is on on um, the maintenance of maintenance of the project site. Mm -hmm. um, 
I just think it's critical that we make sure that as they're performing this work that that the job sites are kept clean, not only for appearance's sake, but there's going to be a lot of kids playing in these things, and sometimes with stuff laying around, it can be a little bit dangerous. So I know a lot of times that gets neglected. I just hope that we'll be um, extra aware that that's... We absolutely agree. And if you look in the contract, we have some language in there specific Sorry, to that. Yeah, yeah I have it here so. on number 48 here, the... Yeah, we, we definitely agree with you and certainly want to make sure that it's safe for use and also at the same time that we don't take a bunch out at a single time where we don't right. have uh, capacity or availability. So we'll try to be strategic about how we do that because we have a piece in that as well where facilities will also be replacing some of the beams when the roof is exposed because that's the time to do it. So we'll take that opportunity to try to uh, make sure that we sequence things properly and do it where it has a minimal impact, if you will, on the, on the public. All right. I just remembered. Okay. Um, I noticed that there was no bond requirement uh, on this contract. Is that because of the dollar limit involved? We, we've had a, a, an internal threshold of basically 50000 for okay. for the performance bond, if you will. So um, I think there was some, some research done on that. And, you know, we had looked at some different pieces. And that kind of came to – that is what we came to the point where we thought that was the – the break-even point, I think statutorily, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe is 100000 is what the requirement would be, so we're technically under that as well. But uh, um, that's, that's where we currently stand. I don't know if Jason has something to add there. Or yeah, the, your, your, your comment is actually correct, is, is, is very correct in the sense that, you know, $50,000 project, our threshold, and this is, of course, half of that, less than half that, but that seems like a big project to the general public for, from a contractor perspective that's pretty small. And the smaller the project, the more burdensome as uh, the cost of bonding, performance bonds, statutory bond, bid bonds, things like that become. And so that's why we decided that uh, the statutorily anything 100000 or more would have to have a, st a statutory bond, which is a payment <coughs> bond. Um, and, uh, and typically those are kind of bought for the same price. You can separate them, but in the market you kind of buy them for the same price. <clears throat> we still want to be more conservative than that and, and bring that down to 50, but we really felt 23, I guess $23,000 somewhere in there was probably too low. Any other questions for staff? Thank you, Dion. Thanks, thanks. Any other uh, public comment on this issue? Seeing none, I would bring it back <coughs> for possible action. I move we award the contract for the roof replacement at Lakewood Park to Midwest Siding in the amount of 23100 for project number 14-3034. Second. I have a motion and a second to award contract for roof replacement of 11 shelter houses in Lakewood Park, project number 14-3035 to Midwest Siding Incorporated in the amount of $23,100. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That just motion just goes. quick correction, is that 3034 or 3035? I have 3035. I have 3034. I believe it's 35. Um, there was a correction made when the original blue sheet went in, and I didn't realize they had changed it to 35, mm. so that's my mistake because I submitted got, a new one. We had this the amended morning. up here. So okay. it is 35, I believe, is right. correct. I still vote aye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that motion then carries 5 0. Moving on to uh, administration. 7.1, second reading ordinance number 14 10735. Amending Chapter 13, Sections 13-1, 13-2, 13-58 through 13-60, 13-131, 13-141, 13-147, and 13-149 of the Salina Code pertaining to the renaming of the Human Relations Department to the Community Relations Department. Ordinance number 14-10735 was passed on first reading on April 28, 2014. Since that time, no comments have been received. Is there any comments or questions from the Commission on this? Any public comment on this issue? Seeing none, I'd bring it back uh, for possible action. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt on second reading ordinance number 14-10735. Second. I have a motion and a second to pass on second reading uh, ordinance number 14-7035. If the clerk would please call the roll. Commissioner Blanchard. Aye. Commissioner Crawford. Aye. Commissioner Hardy. Aye. Commissioner Shirley. Aye. Mayor Householder. Aye. That motion carries 5-0. 7.2 resolution number 14-7098. Approving an incentive request from Lacani Groceries LLC for sales tax reimbursement in the amount not to exceed $250,000. Mr. Scrag. 
Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I believe you're well aware of the, the history of the Dillon's Grocery Store there on Iron, but as a little bit of background, the, the neighborhood Dillon's Grocery Store located at 511 East Iron was closed in conjunction with their opening of their, their superstore located at Ohio and Cloud. And so following the announcement of that, their intention to close, there was a very uh, concerted effort on the part of the North Salina Group and, and the neighborhood and the Chamber of Commerce and, and some local private investors as well as the, the ultimate landlord to try to find a way to, to locate a neighborhood grocery store back in that, that location. Um, as a little bit of, of um, acknowledgement as well as background, I spoke with, with John Gunn, who was one of the, the driving forces in kind of the citizen initiative, and, and I'll certainly defer to him if he wants to elaborate, but he, he identified that uh, at the time he, he wanted to be uh, helpful in, in getting a grocer back downtown after Dillon's made their decision, and that he got involved talking to different grocers and, and realized that a way to kind of incentivize them and get their attention to locate there would be to, to identify some financial incentives. and so. Uh, he took the initiative of, of working with the building buyer and uh, potential franchisees and, and, and attempted to raise money to help cover costs and, and be an enticement to a possible franchisee. And he contacted people uh, to see if they'd be willing to help in that endeavor and he found people very open and willing to participate and they raised funds and contributed funds uh, to that initiative which ultimately then uh, was uh, put towards the, the Save a Lot project that we're talking about today. So there was investment from the building purchaser combined with the funds that, that Mr. Gunn raised and uh, he, he indicated the support was overwhelming. I always hesitate to give credit for fear that I'm going to miss someone, but my understanding of, of the key players that, that helped in that were obviously John Gunn and Kristen Gunn. Uh, other donor, donors included Roy and uh, Donis Applequest, the Earl Bain Foundation, Mike and Debbie Berkeley, First Bank of Kansas, Catron, Randy and Frieda Mai Weiss, Sid and Susie Ritz, Geoprobe and the McCune Foundation. And then I also know that people that were actively involved in, in kind of the information gathering and brokering include Wally Story, the real estate broker, Bob Miller from Bus Boom and Row, uh, Dennis Lover from the Chamber of Commerce. So this definitely was uh, a, a community effort. Um, having said that, those efforts then um, allowed us to reach out and make contact with Lacani Grocers LLC, who is a Save a Lot franchisee, and, and they work closely with the property ownership group, the real estate broker in the chamber and city staff to pursue that location and work out the details. Uh, those efforts included uh, going the extra step of designing and cost estimating capital improvements to the facility so that they could uh, very definitively quantify the cost that would be necessary in terms of renovating the facility. And those costs all ultimately were um, agreed to be carried by the landlord and you know, it, it, there are different ways to do that, but the, the landlord in this case agreed to make that investment and reimbur be reimbursed as part of the lease rate. So at this point, um, the, the city's involvement or the request of the city is to help fund the remaining financial gap. And I, I would tell you that our approach to economic development is rather than respond to the question, question on the front end, and I'm not saying that was the approach in this particular project, but just in a general sense, if we're asked, well, what incentives are available, our approach is let's talk about the project and let's identify a gap and then see what, what tools might be available to, to address that gap. And so in this particular case, after all the other initiatives took place that I described, there's an identified gap of $250,000 uh, and that was the, the basis of the request that's before you today. So city staff reviewed various tools and approaches that might be available and ended up um, working with the Locani grocers uh, with the sales tax reimbursement which is a pay-as-you-go approach. Um, I'll get into the mechanics of it a little bit later, but I think it has value in that it is a pay-as-you-go approach. It is funded out of proceeds generated by the project itself. It doesn't represent an, an unsecured uh, commitment on our part. And so there's a couple of housekeeping items that I want to be sure to, to cover. One is that I want to be sure to clarify a particular concept that, that's in the written staff report as well as a rev resolution. In multiple places, references made to the relationship between the negotiated lease rate and the incentive request. Um, as I mentioned, the financial responsibility for the building improvements can either rest with the tenant or the landlord, depending on the terms reached by the parties. In this particular case, the landlord agreed to finance certain improvements and, and then be reimbursed over time through the lease rate. Staff has not been involved in the lease rate uh, discussions or negotiations, and, and we're not aware of the actual agreed upon 
rate. And so we are in no way suggesting the rate is unreasonable or excessive and needs to be <laughs> subsidized. The, the point that we're trying to make is that the landlord was willing to front the costs on the front end and that the capital inv investments that we're talking about are to be re recouped over time through the lease rate. And that represents an example of an, a, a tangible investment in the community. It's, uh, the point is that it relates to that incentive and the capital investment and, the build, and those costs far exceed the incentive that's being requested and that the investment will have a lasting impact in the community. Put more directly, I guess, the incentive is, can reasonably be viewed as an investment in the building and not an unsecured operational subsidy to an individual commercial operator. So the point in, in those connections between the lease rate and, and the incentive was just that. It's an investment in, in a capital item ultimately by way of the lease rate, not a, an editorial comment about the lease rate. Um, one other housekeeping <coughs> item. The, as part of the conversations with the county grocers and with uh, the North Salina group, there was interest in on, our, on the community's part in conducting an additional fundraising campaign if the project goes forward and is successful. And so condition two of the resolution uh, is intended to address that. And uh, there was an additional suggestion made today that I th think is reasonable and it has been incorporated and highlighted in the copy that you have. And that is an additional sentence at the end of the second condition that says, the city's sales tax reimbursement obligation shall not be reduced by any amounts fundraised, either by collection or pledge, prior to the date of this agreement. And that's in addition to the original language that acknowledged that the reduction was only for fundraising afterwards. The, the significance of that is there has been a community fundraising effort. The intention isn't that, that the sales tax reimbursement be offset by that. It would only be the more grassroots fundraising effort that might occur from this point forward. And so we're just trying to uh, assure the Ilocani grocers and, and their investment group exactly how that'll be applied. And the other item, housekeeping item, is that the uh, signature block has been changed to correspond with the blue sheet so it has Mayor Aaron Householders signing uh, rather than the city manager. So moving back to the blue sheet, um, in terms of conformance with the strategic plan, we identified that it's consistent with our goal that Salina be in a, a city that's exciting to live in, and thriving, economic, and socially. It contributes to a city being clean, attractive, and inviting. And it's also consistent with the commission's goal to have committed to providing the highest quality city services possible within available uh, resources. As far as the fiscal note, um, if authorized, as I mentioned, this fund, this request would be funded from reimbursement of the save a lots sales tax proceeds that they generate at their location and be distributed to save a lot within 30 days of the close of each calendar quarter uh, that the, the city local option sales tax proceeds are received uh, from the immediately preceding calendar quarter. And so it would be processed through the Kansas Department of Revenue. It's specific to just the city's portion of the, uh, the sales tax. And as you might have noticed in the agreement, it, it, the agreement acknowledges that our sales tax rate may fluctuate. It's whatever the resulting uh, available proceeds are will be passed through. Um, it's to be applied to the 511 East Iron uh, location for a term of 10 years or until the principal amount of $250,000 has been distributed, whichever occurs first. Um, and as you may have also noted in the agreement, it is specific to operation of a save a lot uh, franchise by the Lacani grocers at this particular location. It's in a pay-as-you-go distribution of actual sales tax proceeds uh, generated and collected. And it re does represent a reallocation of sales tax funds, but does not represent a financial risk in that it's not an unfunded commitment on the part of the city. So having said all that, um, the Salina, this item went to the Salina Economic Development Incentives Council, and they recommended uh, proceeding with the, the requested sales tax reimbursement. And staff has identified for your consideration um, four item, al four alternatives. One would be to approve the incentive request in the amount not to exceed 250000 to stimulate capital investment in the grocery store building located at 511 East Iron, as well as the operating and uh, opening and operation of a neighborhood gro grocery store at that location in accordance with the attached agreement, and to approve uh, resolution number 1470-98. The second alternative would be to vote to approve the request and the resolution with any amendments that you might uh, feel are appropriate. The third item would be to vote to postpone consideration of this request to a specified date. And the fourth item, which is also numbered item, is number, number three in the blue sheet I just noticed, is to vote to deny the incentive request and the attached uh, agreement and resolution. 
So having provided all that, I do want to acknowledge that, that John Gunn is in the audience, uh, Guy Walker is here as well, and uh, the representatives of the franchise, um, Hanif Lakani, are here as well. So they might wish to address you or certainly be available to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions for staff before we bring up applicants or interested parties? Okay, well, anyone you, I, I think, uh, want to hear, I guess, maybe from the applicant first or any representatives who want to come up and address the commission? I think that would be Hanif. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hanif Lakani, and uh, I own Lakani Grocers, and we just would be excited to be in Salina and open the Save-A-Lot location at that location. Great. And we think it would be a great location. Any questions? Great. No, thank you. How many you. Uh, locations uh, do you currently have? We currently have convenience stores and gas stations in Kansas City, and this would be our first Save-A-Lot. We have been financially approved by Save-A-Lot to open their first location. Uh, is this a direction uh, you're starting to go? Yeah, that's the that's the that's our new company direction. Our plan is to open a few more locations, but this would be first location. Okay, so you're out of Kansas City. That's correct. Then. Great, super. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else from the applicants group? I think everyone else just intends to answer questions if necessary. <laughs> if they come up. Great. Oh, okay. Any uh, public comment on this issue? Anyone? Oh. <coughs> sure. Just state your name and address, if you would, please. Chris Trent, 912 East Ash. Okay. I think it would be a good idea. We have a grocery store back down at this end of town because I live on East Ash, and I see a lot of elderly ladies that get out, and they used to go there when Dillon's was there, and then I see a lot of people in wheelchairs. That would be convenient for them that lives up in this area. So I think it would be a good idea if we get this grocery store in town. I'd be really happy, along with other people. So, thank you. Great. Thank you for coming. <coughs> nice to hear something positive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Barbara Young with North Salina Community Development, uh, also with Triad Manufacturing, 1100 West Grand. Um, I have here, uh, you guys have probably seen this a couple <laughs> times before, uh, there's about approximately 3,000 signatures asking that something be put back in the Dillon store uh, on East Iron. And so I think that kind of speaks to the volume of the support this, this will have. And I think we're all very excited to see uh, Save a Lot uh, come in and uh, do business. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks. Any other public comment on this issue? <coughs> Any more discussion on the part of the commission? I'll make a motion, Mr. Mayor, and then a discussion following a second. Sounds good. Perhaps. Um, Mr. Mayor, I move to uh, improve the sales, <coughs> to move the incentive request for sales tax reimbursement in the amount not to exceed. 250000 to stimulate capital investment in the grocery store building located at 511 East Iron <laughs> Avenue, as well as the opening and operation of a neighborhood grocery store at that location in accordance with the attached economic development grant offer and agreement by, um, I'm sorry here, uh, and um, to approve resolution number 14-7098. Second. Second. It sounded like there was going to be some discussion, so we'll just uh, pause before we, before we vote and let anybody who has uh, comments or discussions to go on. Yeah, I would just like to thank the building, the, the folks that purchased the building and the ownership group of the building and all the hard work put together by the partners, Mr. Gunn, and all of the uh, hard work I know that you did in putting together the investment group and, the, and sticking with the idea of really doing something extremely beneficial for the for that neighborhood. Um, as uh, Ms. Young spoke about 3,000 people signing a petition, and that petition was to support a neighborhood grocery store in that location and to help any potential investor, uh, building owner, and operator to show them that this store would have broad community support. Um, in, in the short week since, uh, or even less than a week, five days since the uh, news came out, 
I've had so many comments from people around the community that are really excited about shopping at Save-A-Lot. So uh, the comments range from it's great to have a store in there and man I'm really curious about what Save-A-Lot has and, and uh, so there's, there's a lot of interest. And then just to speak to the, the fundraising um, part from the North Salina group um, part that's really not I think intended to provide a huge dollar amount of, of money to help pay down part of the city's uh, incentive. That would be great if it did. But more than anything, it's to help to tap back into that spirit of just the support that the community um, will be able, to be able to have to come together to, in the next six months that lead up to the construction of that, kind of keep the excitement alive and, and keep everybody reminded that uh, as a community we really uh, dedicated ourselves to support this venture and and uh, so finally I'd like to thank the operators for taking a chance and and for your comment of, of saying that you're excited to to open your business in Salina so we appreciate that we wish you the best of luck and and I know that this community will get out and support um, that store so thank you all very much Great. Thank you. Uh, this <coughs> topic has taken a long time to uh, to get from the beginning stage the discussion stage to the decision stage but in my mind it's one of the easiest decisions that we could make for Salina for me it's uh, what what you call a no-brainer um, to have a grocery store back on East Iron <coughs> makes all the sense in the world not only for the people that in that neighborhood that uh, need a grocery store close by so they can walk uh, to and from the store to buy their groceries, but also there's a, a substantial amount of drive-by traffic uh, going in different directions that, and I've heard as much from those people as I had from the people in the neighborhood that really missed that store and uh, did not want to drive the extra two miles to an, a different grocery store on their way home from work. And, and so I think this is going to be a, uh, a great asset for the community and I, uh, I wish you all the success in the world with it. I also would like to comment that I was there during the petition signing that night and people were so disappointed that they thought we weren't going to get a store. It also adds I think some uh, credence to the fact that we want to redo East Iron Avenue. So that'll look, that'll help that area, bring that area up quite a bit. You know, we did have I, one question I forgot to ask, and no one else uh, brought it up. Do we have an estimated uh, time on when you want to start this and a, a date when you want to finish and maybe open? If you don't mind coming back up, I'm sorry. We didn't talk about any of that. Overall, construction should take uh, anywhere from five to six months, so we should be open this year, about the okay. end of the year. Okay, so you're wanting to move pretty quick on yeah, this. Yeah. Good. We're ready to move forward. Good deal. Thank you. I would just add again. I echo what what my other commissioners have have said. If this really goes, and of course, I, I can't thank the the people who who took time themselves to volunteer and spearhead this. I know Mr. Gunn was involved heavily. Um, it it goes to what this commission has all been about, and that is reutilizing the areas of town. There was a big fear that there would just be a void where that store was, and we've got a pharmacy there. We've got a We've got a, a laundromat. I believe there's still a hair salon over there. And, and, and we really like the idea of aggregating properties together. And it's so much better than expanding and building new streets and putting in new infrastructure. And and, and, and I would echo again, it's not just serving what this, this gentleman was saying, the people that are there, the elderly, it's, it's, it's going to be great for them because there are two, I think Johnstown Towers and, and the other one, they're very close proximity. But I use it. My business is over on State Street. I live up on Pine Ridge, and I pass it every day. And it was my little grocery store. It was the right size. I didn't have to go in and fight through tons and tons of traffic. And it was just the right size. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, we're a small family, so we don't need the, the, the truckload of, of stuff. So I'm real excited. I, I would put in my request early that I'm going to need you guys to stock monster cereals because I have to order it on Amazon right now. But, um, <laughs> like but, uh, Frankenberry? I, I, yeah, Frank. Actually, Booberry is my favorite. So if, if i got to settle That's on funny. one, Boo Booberry is my favorite. Who but but uh, I don't get it very often. But uh, uh, I, I really am excited about it. And, and I know John, uh, he has not taken the credit for it, but I know early on he was over there uh, helping with the 
the the uh, the signature uh, gathering in a lot of things. There's just been a lot of people in the community who who really look forward to this. It's it's a classic Salina location. I know I've mentioned trying to bring the neon of some sort. I don't know what Save a Lot's rules are, but I'd love to see that neon back on there again. I used to like driving by at night. It just reminded me of a of a era of of days past that I really liked, and and uh, maybe something in the future can happen there. But uh, I really look forward to it. I think uh, Salina's going to benefit greatly, and I appreciate you taking the chance in our community. I, th I think you'd be happy you did. So, with that, if there's no other comments or questions or anything from there, I'd. We have, I believe, a motion and a second to approve the incentive request for sales tax reimbursement in an amount not to exceed $250,000 to stimulate capital investment in the grocery store building located at 511 East Iron Avenue, as well as the opening and operation of a neighborhood grocery store at that location in accordance with the attached economic development grant offer and agreement by voting to authorize the mayor, myself, to develop yeah. grant offer and agreement by voting to authorize the the mayor, that just feels so weird to say, to, exec <laughs> to execute the attached safe line of economic development sales tax reimbursement agreement um, and approve resolution number 14-7098. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That motion carries 5-0. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. That moves us. I've got to learn how to say that. That's weird saying my own business. Uh, <laughs> and no development business. Any other business today? I, uh, I see we have an executive session, possibly. No? Maybe. Hmm. You want to say? Whoa. Other business? Oh, um, <clears throat> you know, just a quick, just a quick note about in, in other business here. Um, just a quick comment and thank you to North Salina Community Development Group and uh, members of city staff that were involved in the unveiling of the public art piece on North 9th and North Broadway at the Five Corners location. It was a great event attended by about 60 people and then a reception at Dick Bergen studio on North Santa Fe afterward. It was a really nice occasion to pretty much celebrate the art and work of uh, the artist Larry Meidel who unfortunately has passed away I think about 20 years ago but there was about 40 members of his family and residents of western Kansas in town yesterday to to attend and so I think it's safe to say there there are about 40 people plus now in western Kansas that love Salina <laughs> so it was a nice event it was a it was it was a, a beautiful day uh, we had a great turnout and a lot of work and effort went to that went into that and it's turned out really nice and I'd like to thank my fellow commissioners for uh, being there as well and I know that it really meant a lot to uh, Mr. Meidel's elderly mother and I don't know how old she was but she she's in her 90s I'm sure and uh, 95? 85. 85 I'm sorry Ms. Meidel. Whoa. <laughs> I was going to say she didn't look a day over 84 but yeah. Oops. Okay so I'm going to stop now. <laughs> but, but anyway it, I, I know it made her day and and their family was extremely proud and and uh, they just and and also our, our local relatives um, Nancy Bassett and her family and, and Greg Stevenson and his family who were cousins um, it was just a great day so thanks thanks to everybody that made that possible great. I move to recess into executive session for 30 minutes to discuss with legal counsel mem uh, matters subject to the attorney-client privilege for the reason that public discussion of those matters would waive the privilege and adversely affect the city's interest in the matters and reconvene at um, 540. Second. I have a motion and a second to move into executive session for 30 minutes and reconvene at 540. Do we anticipate any business after this? We do not. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We're in executive session for 30 minutes. After a quick break. Okay.